in 2019. This is a five-year mission. We're going way out there. And yes, this is a very bold talk. And unfortunately, I'm not like Spock. I didn't cheat and come back to the past and tell everyone what, what's happening. But I just want to try and give some ideas out here. Because like, far be it for me to have all the answers, particularly like going to, into the future. I mean, we, we have no idea what's going to happen. The one thing I will not talk about is this. No discussion of the name. It's, you've been forewarned. But we are going to do some time travel. I know the font's a little bit small, and unfortunately time travel was removed from Postgres a long time ago. But it's really important to take a look back. In fact, let, let's stick with the five-year theme. Let's go back to 2009. You know, what was happening in the world back then? Well, for one thing, you know, this is a little US focused, I'm sorry, but Barack Obama just started his first term in the office. We're getting through this whole financial crisis where suddenly everyone knew what a collateralized debt obligation is, or at least understood enough that this like, kind of crashed like, the whole financial system. And uh, there was the swine flu. Remember that nasty little thing? I had it. It's horrible. Don't get it. So these things are starting, were starting to become big. We call them solid state drives. But they're still expensive and unreliable. I mean, they probably still are today to some degree, but they're better. And this little company had just launched in South by Southwest. I mean, I'm sure everyone's already checked in this morning, but, and also you might know that they use Postgres or used to use Postgres. How about this, this little piece of technology, Redis? Hey, it had just launched. Huh. And, uh, and a lot of people are, are definitely using it today. And of course, our friend Node, Node.js. It did not exist yet. So yeah, a lot has changed in five years you know, in the world, in technology. And one very important thing that happened that year, on April 20th, 2009, was a company called Oracle acquired a company called Sun Microsystems for a good chunk of change. But why was that so important? Because the year before, this company, Sun Microsystems, acquired a company called MySQL, this open source database for a good chunk of change, too. And you know, the, like, the long-term ramifications of this, I mean, you know, we've seen over the course of five years, particularly for our little community, which at the time was, eight, the, it was age 8.3 going on 8.4. So what was cool, I mean, if we look back five years ago, you know, the conferences are just starting to pick up steam at this point, that you know, there's more and more people coming. This is a photo from uh, the 2009 European conference. And you know, we're really starting to see you know, much, more in, you know, much more interaction on the advocacy side and the educational side of Postgres, in addition to all the development that's gone into the software. I mean, in A3, I mean, if you look back, you know, we're, we're in Postgres A3 at this point. And you know, we suddenly have full text searching core. We have you know, some more advanced data types, you know, some, more, some different indexing uh, features, different performance improvements. And, you know, this, this 8.4 release was coming down the block with like this whole mess of things. Like, in fact, I know it's hard to read in the back because there was just so much going on in 8.4, which is why it was like such a solid, stable release. I mean, I can't, I can't go a day without writing a common table expression query. I mean, it just, it's become like such a fundamental part of my life. But at this point, there's still a lot of things missing in Postgres. You know, we didn't have built-in uh, replication. We didn't even have read-only replicas we could just pull up at any time and look in. It was kind of a pain to install ex extensions. We didn't have writable CTEs, another thing I can't live without. About foreign data wrappers. I mean, we were talking about SQL MED at that point, but you know, we didn't really have you know, what we have today. And you know, sort of like et cetera, et cetera. Like a lot of nice things that we have in Postgres now we didn't have. And that user group I told you about, NYC Pug, didn't even exist. So, Let's, let's fast forward. I mean, clearly, this is an understatement. And you know, it's not just like Postgres, the product itself, that's changed. It really is the community that you know, we've grown, we've matured. We're, you know, we're at the point where there's a lot of really good things going on for us. And a lot of perceptions about the community have changed. I mean, five years ago, we wouldn't have seen a statement like this, that Postgres is the preferred open source relational database for you know, everyone across the usage gamut. I mean, th this was like when I saw this, I was like, wow, this is like, such a big statement. I mean, this, this is awesome. It's like validation for all the hard work everyone in the community has been putting in. But at the same time, you know, some perceptions haven't changed as well. So 
I found this on a, on a, a popular hosting provider. It was comparing uh, you know, different, different databases. And first thing, you know, disadvantages of Postgres, performance. For simple, read-heavy operations, Postgres can be overkill. Uh, that's debatable. Popularity. Given the nature of this tool, it lacks behind in terms of popularity, despite the very large amount of deployments. Well, for, well first, I don't understand that sentence. But secondly, <laughs> it's like, what is, I mean, it, it is popular. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people supporting it at this point. And hosting. This is on a hosting provider's website, and they're saying that there's not as many hosting providers out there for, for Postgres, which again, you know, th there's a lot of tools for it now. Like, you know, how do, how do we get over these perceptions? I mean, are there some truth to them? Eh, kind of, but we know as a community that that's not necessarily true. And you know, we, we want people to understand you know, the, basically the, the proper way to use Postgres. So ultimately, how do we make ourselves the preferred database? You know, not even the preferred relational database, just the preferred database, period. You know, and I think it's important to understand you know, the structure of our community. If you look at it here, you know, Postgres is a decentralized model that we have a lot of individuals contributing to the project and a lot of different companies and companies employing individuals and just like any permutation that you can think of. But it's not like it, there's no single point of failure that you know, as long as there's enough money and support in the community that Postgres will go on forever. As long as people are using it, Postgres will be here forever or at least until you know, we, we, go back, we stop using computers and go back to using abacuses. But you know, this, is, this is like a great thing because you know, we're decentralized. You know, we're not a community like this where it's a company and they've released an open source project, but you know, they, you know, they have some employees that they've hired to work on it and maybe some people outside contributed and maybe there's a consultant contributing to it. But really, the company is still controlling the open source project. So there is a single point of failure, and I think we've seen this play out in the market that you know, if that company goes away, suddenly you know, there will be a market shift and people will be using different technology. But the unfortunate thing when you have, I guess the unfortunate thing for us is that you know, without this model, we'll probably never see a number like this. Does anyone know what this number is? Close. Um, it's, actually, it's actually Oracle's uh, sales general and administrative budget. Or for all intents and purposes, it's a company in Northern California, which is how I will refer to them. Um, and actually, I did some, I read some interviews and did some math, and this is, you know, probably, this is uh, my estimate for their marketing budget based upon what their VP CMO said uh, in 2008. So that's a lot of money. Like, for, for like any company to spend on marketing, I mean, I mean, they could like, you know, fund this entire conference and then some. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's frame the problem a bit. You know, what exactly are we trying to solve? I mean, first it's important to understand what we do well right now in our advocacy efforts. Is it our meetups? Is it our mailing list? Is it, you know, is it something else? Like, what, what permutation of it do we do well? And what are our weaknesses? Because if we don't understand what we don't do well, you know, we can't get better at the, the overall Postgres promotion. And of course, like, what can we do as a community to build and retain Postgres adoption? And, you know, not just bring new people in, but keep them there. So, what are our strengths? I mean, I think what Postgres does really well as a community, and I think we'll all agree on this, is support. Like, we, are, we have an amazing support structure, just even organically. The mailing lists are phenomenal, IRC. I mean, in, in the Postgres IRC channel, there are people from other database communities or using different databases come in to ask questions because they know they'll get a good answer in the Postgres channel. We have, we have very good consultants. I mean, there are consultants who could like, work on any technology project, let alone Postgres, but they carry such a level of expertise that you know, it keeps people coming, coming into the community. And user groups. As long as a user group is consistent with its meetups, whether it's every month, like we do in New York, or every three months, or just establishing a schedule that, where people can attend, you know, the user groups tend to thrive, and that, po and that local Postgres community thrives as well. We're also a very open community. I mean, not just in the sense of open source. We're just very open to people participating and joining and very encouraging. You know, when I started in the community five years ago, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you a common table expression from you know, a, a temporary table, necessarily. And you know, people you know, still encourage me to, to participate. And I think that's something that, you know, that is recognized and really something you know, we should just continue to do. 
We also, we also have like the best, I, I think we have the best database documentation in the world. I mean, it's second to none. It's so robust, it has a lot of information, and even the, the website just has a plethora of information to learn about Postgres and understand the project. And we also have top-notch bloggers. I mean, if you read some of these blogs that go through Planet Postgres, I mean, it's, I mean why, why bother going to college? I mean, you're going to you're gonna get a very good database education from them, which, by the way, I mean, personally, I think you should still go to college, but we're not going to have that debate. So let's, uh, you know, this is going to sort of set up the rest of the talk. Like, where can we improve? So the website. <laughs> this is sort of like, you know, it's like it, it's good, but, you know, th there's definitely things we, we can do better on it. Outreach. Outreach is something I think we've actually been organically getting better, perhaps you know, somewhat purposely, somewhat not, over the past few years. But you know, we do need to speak outside the community. I mean, a lot, a lot of, you know, particularly like the open source companies um, you know, that have you know, giant marketing budgets behind them will go to like, all the different user groups to promote their technology. And there's no reason why we shouldn't, particularly you know, going, going to local user groups is, of course, like, a much easier proposition because you know, there's less travel costs associated with it. And also, we should just, just reach out to help groups, you know, reach out to schools, reach out to organizations that can you know, benefit from learning about Postgres. I think, um, you know, and the other thing on this we're going to focus on is uh, leveraging untapped marketing resources. What that means is that, you know, social media, it's everywhere, you know. I mean, that's sort of an obvious statement, but, you know, we have companies that have marketing budgets and certain marketing expertise that we as community members might lack. And, you know, working with them more will allow us to basically promote Postgres more to an, a larger audience. I think there's also some things that are out of our control which is, these are some statements I've heard you know, while you know, ma making the rounds that I, I just thought were amusing, I wanted to share. You know, one is, like, I need 24-7 support, but are there enough resources available? You know, it's not like calling up like, that company in Northern California and there's probably 2,000 people there at any given moment to answer the call. I love this one. When there's a problem, I don't know who to sue. Yes, this is a real statement. Yeah, it's, it wasn't from a tech person. do not want that person. Yes, well. <laughs> Yeah, but it's actually from their legal department, which is actually gets into the third part. It's, I want to contribute to the community, but there's certain legal and regulatory restrictions we have to work with. And I mean, of, actually of all of these, I mean, I think uh, number one and number three are things we can work with. Number two is, I, I, I'll agree with Josh on that one, you know, there's only so much we can do. But anyway, let's, start, let's dive into like, what, what we can do better. Here's the website. Ta-da! So what it... I'm going to ask a few questions, so let's see if we can answer them based on this page. What is Postgres? <laughs> so, if we go up here... Yes. What does that mean? It's a good question. How is this different than every other database out there? Can I find, can I find this on the home page? Uh, how about this? Is it easy to download? Well, there's a button to download it. I mean, it's a little small, but it's bolded. It stands out. But, you know, it, I, I think we all know if you click into it, we'll get a page where you choose your installation, then you have to click further, et cetera, et cetera. Where can I learn more? Where can I learn more about Postgres? Should, should I click Documentation? Should I click Developers? About. FAQs? Well, I click About? I could click About, but, I mean, what does About tell me? So, I mean, look, this is not to beat down on the website because, you know, quite honestly, if you're already in the community, as, as Bruce just pointed out, it's a good website. But there's not as many call to actions on it, I think, that, you know, like a good modern open source website has. So this is an example I used a few years ago, and they've actually kept the same exact website, and there's a reason why. You know, Git has a really good open source website. What's the very first line? Git is a free and open source distributed version control system designed to handle everything from small to very large projects with speed and efficiency. Great, I know exactly what it does. But how is it different? Read the next line. Git is easy to learn and has a tiny footprint with lightning fast performance. It outclasses SCM tools like Subversion, CVS, Perforce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I know exactly how it's different. I mean, of course, the devil's in the details. We all know that. But you know, the idea is that you're trying to draw people in with like, you know, two sentences. We, also, it, we know it's easy to download. It detected I was on a Mac. It had the package ready for me to go. You know, I, didn't, I didn't even need to think about it. And you know, there's, it basically shows where all the, you know, there's a tutorial right here, documentation's right here. You know, there's a book over here. Everything just all within like one screen, 
pretty easy to read. And by the way, you know, Git is non-trivial too. I mean, I, I'm sure some of you could imagine when Postgres moved from CVS to Git, you know, there was a learning curve. I mean, Git's a complex piece of software, but at the same time, if you look at the Debian download graph, I mean, look, I mean, look, look how much Git grew, like in terms of usage within like two years. It's like, I mean, I guess I, we gotta look at the scale. I want to say that's like an exponential curve, but it might just be quadratic. But still, I mean, it literally has more downloads than all, you know, all of the other, all of the other um, source control systems. I mean, part of that's also is that the efforts GitHub did to build a, a to build a, a developer community around open source, but how were they able to do that? Because people could learn Git, they could understand it, they could contribute easily. So we should have some goals with our website. We need to modernize it. You know, put, put a little paint on it, you know, improve, you know, g give it like more of an update look, to look and feel. You know, we should probably also consider making it mobile friendly because often I might be trying to talk to someone about Postgres and I try to pull it up on my phone and be like, oh, go to the website. Uh, wait, hang on, I'll zoom in. And you know, one thing, another thing is just easier navigation. Let's just get like all the most important things on the home page. Like we, sh we should be able to have like two sentences at the top. This is Postgres. This is what it is. Here are like the links exactly to learn more. You know, bring you right to the front page of the documentation. And you know, we should also highlight the support resources too. Remember, we have amazing consultants in this community. I mean, we should be like just lucky that we have you know some some of these individuals. You know. Help, you know, helping us to be better developers and you know, helping the world to be better developers. You know, we should highlight that we, you know, we have this available. In fact, uh, we just did a, a review of our professional services and we willed it down from 320 to 183, in part because a lot of these companies didn't exist. But you know, that directory is up to date now and you know, we, we've modified all the listings. You know, we, should, we should promote it, let people know there is 24-7 support available. And of course, you know, the content, which I'm going to address the content, you know, a, a little bit more as we go on. But you know, it, it's good, you know, we have like a mature, active community. We should, our website should reflect that. Why am I harping on this so much? You know, PostgreSQL.org. This is for a lot of people. This is the first impression they have of the project and the community, which means that this is probably our most powerful advocacy tool, and we, we really should reflect that. Because, I mean, we want people to come and we want people to stay. And we just want to make it as easy as possible for them to do it. So, outreach. Our conferences. We do a very good job with our conferences, overall. From the feedback I've heard from you know, the variety, you know, I go to a lot of Postgres conferences. I, you know, I'm addicted. I love them. And there's a reason why. It's because they're very good. And a lot of it's because the community enforces the quality. That there's always people at these conferences making sure that they're the best, you know, everyone there is representing the community as best they can. But, you know, we still need to grow attendance. I don't think we've hit a critical mass yet at the community. And we should really encourage more people to participate. I mean, we do have some very good speakers in the community. It's always great to hear, you know, the updated content they have. But we should always get more people. You know, there's more ideas out there. There's more things we could learn. And of course, what would make this easier to encourage more people to attend is $8.4 billion. But, you know, I, unfortunately, we don't have that right now. But there's other things we can do. As I mentioned earlier, we can speak at other conferences. And as I've said, like, we're getting better about that as a community. And I think really the low-hanging fruit is just going to like, our own locales, going to the other user groups, and speaking at them. So I can tell you that in, in NYC Pug, we do need to be better about that. We actually are going to be speaking to the New York Linux Users Group, which is a 5,000-plus member group later in the year. Um, and, you know, I, and I think we're going to make a better effort just to get our, our better speakers in the community just to go to the different groups and talk about you know, things related to Postgres. And really it comes down to identifying what their problem is. So Node.js community, what is your problem when you're dealing, dealing with data storage? You know, Python community, what, what do you look at? Et cetera, et cetera. The last thing is you know, participate in educational programs. I mean, what better way to learn Postgres than while you're at school? And I think you know, a, a lot of the concepts are basic enough that you, know, you can go into a university, maybe, maybe even go into a high school and talk about you know, relational data. I mean, just get the, the fundamental understanding there. I mean, I think we know that data is a hard subject. You know, it's different than a lot of the things that you learn in computer science. And being able to frame the problem correctly early on to people will, for one thing, will, I mean, they'll be testing everything out on Postgres, which is great. Another thing is that regardless, we're going to create a much better, smarter user base. So another thing we should also work on is expanding our own partnerships and even just growing ones that are, already exist. 
So Postgres. I think, you know, as Postgres people, we know this is hand in glove with Postgres. I mean, it's, it's built on top of Postgres. And it's a great community. And geospe geospatial people are very active folks who just, I mean, love building you know, just related applications. But, you know, there is somewhat of a disconnect between the two communities. And it's not intentional. And I think it's because, you know, both communities are focusing on different problems. But, you know, we should probably synchronize a bit more. And some of it can actually be reflected in, in, the, in the website. I was browsing around the Postgres website, website actually doing research for a different talk. And I went to this t uh, web page on performance tips. And it's basically giving me performance tips based on Postgres version 8.0 which some of those things have been already solved in you know, later versions. But when did, when did 8.0 come out? I mean, that's 10 years ago, right? And I, I really hope people aren't running things you know, on 8.0 at this point. But I mean, you, you, know, you never know. But I think, you know, if, you know, for instance, you know, with Postgres, I think you know, there's a lot of work where we can collaborate on. Because they have, they have a very strong community. And a lot of Postgres people don't necessarily know that there's all these features and functions in Postgres itself that they can leverage as well. So there's a mutually beneficial opportunity for community growth, and it's really something you know, we should work on together. So what should you get out of this? Educated users is really a stronger community for us. A stronger community means there's more potential to grow the community and basically you know, you know, grow the product, grow the user base, and just basically you know, in, you know, just more further enforce you know, everything we're trying to do. So this brings me to, I think, a topic people love hearing about in the tech world called marketing. Because tech people tend to have this view of marketing. So it's, it's a little blurry, so I'll read it. So we can't compete on price. We also can't compete on quality, features, or service. That leaves fraud, which I like to call marketing. So here's the good news. We can compete on all these things, so we don't need to resort to fraud. And you should never resort to fraud anyway. But there's a good question in this, is that what would make someone want to change you know, his or her default choice of database? It's a fair question. It's much easier to get someone in school to start out on using Postgres and you know, use it for you know, the rest of their lives. But you know, let's say you know, I've been using SQL Server for so many years. I'm comfortable with it. You know, why would I want to switch? There's really three reasons why people switch products, and it's in this order. They feel threatened, they think it's more cost effective, or they think it's a better product. Being a better product is the last reason why people are going to change. And this is true. This has been proven time and time again. And the thing is, as in the community, we play really well in these two areas. I mean, we have a good argument for number two. Uh, it's open source. It's free. There's no licensing cost. So I, of course, you know, people can bring up, well, maybe I need to pay for you know, support contracts and licensing fees. Well, not licensing fees, support contracts, you know, consultant fees, et cetera. But it's still going to be much cheaper than some other database uh, software licenses. So the key is that we need to make people feel threatened. Well, what does it mean to feel threatened? Well, it's not intimidation. I mean, intimidation works, but you, you really don't do that in legitimate business. But you feel threatened in business, or even in your life, when you know, so, there's like something life-changing, that you feel that if you're not using this product, your life is going to be dramatically altered. I mean, wh why do I have a smartphone? Because well, if, if I'm disconnected from email for like five minutes, like, you know, the whole world's going to end? I mean, it's probably not, but you know, I mean, it, it's a tool that I mean, it's a, it's a tool that I need to use to get around my daily life. Like, I can't figure out how to do, you know, I can't figure out how to walk from the hotel to uh, the University of Ottawa without it. But really, when you feel threatened, it's usually surrounding something with loss. Like, if we don't move this product, we're going to lose, you know, X amount of dollars. Or we're going to lose employees because they're not happy here because, you know, they don't like the software stack we're building on. Or we're going to lose market share because our competitors are, you know, using this product. And it, look, look how much it's enhancing their, their growth. So that's really the key. Like, how do we threaten people without calling up Tony Soprano? Rest in peace. Well, it really comes down, a lot of it has to do with market pressures and you know, how we measure these pressures. That, again, if I see this competitor using Postgres and like, their sales and productivity are up by whatever percentage, maybe I should move over to it. Or maybe that they're saving so much money that you know, they, they've you know, increased their development time and their output. Like, you know, they're, outp they're completely outpacing us. Like, we're going to be out of business in a year. The way we do this is through case studies. 
because you know case studies basically you know give these examples in ways that pe it's easy for people to digest and read. And I already know uh, Renee Dager at Enterprise DB has been trying to compile a bunch of case studies that she wants to give to the community that you know we can use. We could we could feature them prominently on the website and show like you know here's you know, here's how company X like they were on database X and they moved to Postgres and suddenly you know they cut out like 90% of their overhead on it. I mean, I think that entices people, you know, particularly at the enterprise level, to you know, move over to Postgres. But a key word in this is that we also need to promote it, too. And when we think about promotion, we think about this whole mess, this whole fragmented mess of social media. And like, I'm sure I'm missing quite a few social networks. So currently, what's Postgres like on social media? Well, much like our community, you know, it's decentralized. Which is okay. I mean, you know, we have we have some very influential voices, and you know, we have like you know people trying to support all these different communities. You know, we have some corporate Twitter accounts that have a good following. We have, you know, likewise with some personal accounts. There's like four or five different LinkedIn groups. Like I've lost track. I mean, talk about decentralization within one group. And of course, you know, there's different people active on different uh, different social media platforms. I mean, I'm personally I'm more active on Twitter when I'm promoting Postgres. I don't really use Facebook as much. I don't use you know, LinkedIn. But you know, all of these are different marketing channels. And you know, we need to understand them you know, for what they are and figure out the best way to utilize them to make sure we're getting the right message across about the community. So in terms of official accounts, I mean, I was, I was like looking around to see, do we have like any official accounts we can broadcast messages from? And it, I think it's really just Planet Postgres. And someone please correct, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I, I, I did, um, I, I'm not going to say I did a very thorough search, but I spent about 10 minutes on it. Um, I mean, look, I mean, the idea is, you know, I think it's great the community has a decentralized model. But the issue is when we have that, we run into issues like this, where we have an account that looks like a completely legitimate Postgres account. It's even PSQL. And suddenly one day, there's like a bunch of spam going through it before it gets back to its normal feed. And you know, it appears that's coming from us. It's like, oh, Postgres got hacked, or the community got hacked. You know, is something wrong with it? And you know, it's. It, I mean, we know this is not us, but you know, it's better to avoid these situations anyway, just because like, it, no, no one benefits from it. But of course, you know, what's the what's the easiest way to enhance our social media presence? You got it. Eight point four billion dollars. <laughs> I know money money solves everything in this case, but we don't have that. Not yet. And honestly, social media could be a full-time job for us. I mean, it really is. Our community has grown so much. There is so much usage. I mean, I mean, we could have like a corporate relations department or a user relations department, to put it in a better way. So here's some suggestions. I don't know if these are right. I don't know if these are wrong. If you read my final bullet point, I say we, we do need to research this much more. But I mean, we do need, we do need to like have like a, a better social media strategy as a community. Um, possibly, we might want to have a centralized Twitter account. And some of the other open source communities do have that, both, um, both the ones that are open, like our model, are open in terms of the, the well, definitely the ones that have the corporate entity backing them have an official Twitter account. But it could be something where, you know, much like the news that we post on the website, like, you know, we curate it, we decide exactly what goes up on it. You know, maybe it's the press releases. Maybe it's you know the conference updates. Maybe it's you know a featured blog entry during the week. I mean, this is something that we have to research and look into. But you know, we're at the point where you know if we really want to help create more of a buzz around Postgres in the world, we really need to attack social media more. Speaking of buzz, when you see this, what do you think of? Web exactly, web scale. Well, MongoDB is a web scale database and doesn't use SQL or joins, so it's high performance. And here's the thing. Maybe this is, doesn't necessarily put MongoDB in like, the best light when you watch the whole entire presentation. And, even, and the thing is, you know, the author of it says like, he likes MongoDB and he uses it for a lot of things. But guess what? This created buzz. When you think of MongoDB, you think web scale. I guess when you think web scale, you think MongoDB. But the idea is that you know, you remember it. It's, this is something memorable. I mean, and something like wildly organic, you know, really, I mean, this, this really helped to put MongoDB on the map. Again, maybe not in the most flattering light, but you think about it, and that's just half the battle, to get people thinking about it. 
So how do we create some memorable buzz, memorable buzz for Postgres? We've had some flashes in the pan. You know, we've had, you know, depending on certain releases and you know, certain things that have happened, you know, there's been some buzz around Postgres. But you know, I don't think we've had our web scale moment yet. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know, there's more we can do on this. And of course, it's, it's hard to create buzz like that. I mean, you know, it could, you know, I mean that, that MongoDB, my SQL video, was you know, sort of like, a, like probably like a, a late night you know, fantasy. Like, oh, let me like, make these characters animate and like, express my thoughts. Like, who knew how viral it would go? But the thing is, we actually we have some unique opportunities right now at this moment to just get on that memorable buzz train. For one thing, we have JSONB. We basically, you know, we took the document storage model and put it into the relational model, and we're actually doing it, you know, possibly faster than these other systems. I mean, time and benchmarking will tell. But look, it's like you, you have all the benefits of the document model with all the benefits of Postgres tied into one system. I mean, that's something, you know, I think, I think we already have a general consensus of the community that, like, we need to promote that. But the thing is, other people are already, you know, doing the document model. What's something unique Postgres is doing? The foreign data wrappers. I mean, the fact that I can like push and pull data to like any other database system from Postgres without like needing to worry about, you know, like other drivers and other languages, and you know, I'm sure, you know, of course, you know, you have to install them properly, but that's unique. That's incredibly powerful. I can basically like control like my entire data universe to to quote Dave Page right from Postgres. Like we should be playing that up, like you know, like there's no tomorrow. We should feature all these foreign data wrappers, you know, prominently on our website. And the idea is that, and of course, I, I have to like, you know, I, I hate saying this, but like, you got to promote your flashy features in order to like get people to stay for the awesomeness. Because, you know, Postgres is sort of like, you know, like when you think of Postgres is kind of like Volvo. It's like a safe, good car. You know, you don't necessarily want to like take your Volvo out and like do 150 kilometers per hour on the highway. You know, you want it to get you safely from point A to point B. And yes, I had to swallow my pride to use kilometers. I know, it's, it's tough. But the idea is that, you know, you know there's, a, like, there's a certain, we do have some flair. And if we play up our flair to, like, we can lure people in and learn more about how to use a good database system. Here's the other thing. We still, we have some things coming down the road, too, that, you know, have some flash. As well, I mean, the logical replication. I mean, we're getting the first iteration of it in this release, but that's that's a really unique feature. We can replicate. We can basically replicate Postgres into any database. I mean, I wish I had that, you know, yesterday. You know, we also have the bidirectional replication coming down the road. And again, I, I don't want to get into the debate of like when you use BDR versus when you don't use it. But I mean, that's pretty cool. Like, you know, for us to be able to do that natively. And also some of the advanced indexing things coming up. Um, Min-max indices, like I honestly haven't followed the hackers thread in a while, but the fact that if it does work, you know, you can basically index like gigantic data sets, but your index takes up like nothing. That's pretty cool. Um, I, know, uh, I, know, I know the Russian gang is going to talk about uh, the vodka index coming up too. You know, that's going to be very interesting to see what's going on with that. But these are all things designed to just keep Postgres at the forefront of performance. And of course, I mean, who knows what else is going to come up in the next few years. But you know, there are ways that we can really generate buzz for the community. But of course, how do we do it? That's the $8.4 billion question. I mean, this is what, you know, you, you can have like, the best advertising minds in one room, and they still can't come up with like, you know, that killer campaign. It's hard. But you know, we, do have, you know, we do have some corporate marketing resources behind the community and you know, people who are willing to help. And you know, we should leverage those in addition to you know, what we can provide as well. And you know, take advantage of all these new marketing channels that have opened up. And really, ultimately, it, it's going to come down to like, just taking something, throwing it against the wall, seeing what sticks. The key, though, is we've got to focus on what makes Postgres unique. It's one thing to say, like, oh, you know, we're faster than the database X. We're more secure than the database X. But like, what's going to stand out are our unique features. Again, foreign data wrappers. Who is doing that? What's, what's another, tell me another database that can connect to every other database easily. Is there one? OK, Oracle. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, so yeah. But, but, but here's the point. So, so maybe Oracle can do it. But here's the thing. What, what, what do you have to spend in order to be able to do that with Oracle? Oracle 
OK. But I, I think that's the point. Here we are. We're giving the technology away. It's yours. Have fun. In fact, you create your own. You know, if you're in the other talk where you're learning how to write for our data wrappers, you, know, you could be making some right now, too. So we really want to focus on what makes Postgres unique and find the right way to like, put that message out there. Because let's face it, we don't want to bring in Tony Soprano to start threatening people to change the Postgres. So what can we do right now? What are some actionable items to make sure we can get the advocacy message out there and like, be consistent about it? I think one thing, we've really matured as a community to the point where it's, you know, we're large. We have different you know, sub-communities for other things going on. I mean, we have Core, which is over, you know, basically overseeing you know, how we're releasing things. We have the security team, which is you know, managing any security things that come up. There's the infrastructure team, managing all the gazillion servers Postgres has. There's the WWW team, which deals with, um, I guess, posting news and keeping the website up to date. But we really should have an advocacy subcommittee because the thing is, advocacy is something very emotional, as it should be. You know, we're, we're, we're basically, you're trying to get an emotional response to get people to use your software. Because you know, logic, can, you know, logic can go only so far. You, know, you want people to enjoy using Postgres. Like, it's a pleasure to use it. And in order to do that, I mean, there's going to be a lot of different opinions on how to do it. And I think that's great. And we should, of course, always listen and basically aggregate everyone's opinions. But there should be a subcommittee that focuses on executing the strategy of making sure Postgres can be adopted by more and more people. And some of the immediate, again, you know, one of the immediate things is helping to establish that policy. And the other thing is, you know, we really, we, we, we got to bring the, the website into this decade. And, you know, that's something, you know, that's something that really, isn't that hard to do? And I think with like, a committee focusing on it, we can go, we can gather opinions, we can take all the feedback, and we can present something that's modern and you know, very easy to use and really, really leverage our website as our most powerful advocacy tool. Another thing that you know, everyone can do very easily is just speak at other meetups, speak at other conferences. Hey, let's go to PyCon. Let's go to MySQL. Well, maybe not MySQL Con. I don't even know if there is one. Let's go to Mongo World. Let's talk about you know combining you know the Mongo FDW with Postgres. You know, let's go to um, let's go to BSD Can. You know, stay the week before. You know, let's talk to the BSD folks. See you know how we can work together. Let's go to you know let's go to geospatial conferences. And I think you know that th that serves like two purposes. It's one you know of course we can comp promote Postgres to these other communities, but we can also learn more about how they're using it you know, through, through all these discussions and you know, build a better product. We definitely need to aggregate the case studies that we have. I mean, we know, I think we all know individually, a lot of people who've either switched to Postgres or built up their companies on Postgres and like, some of the awesome things that have happened. Let's promote it to the world. And of course, let's create some buzz, which again, this, this, this might be the hardest of all of them because we don't know what's going to stick. But you know, you got to try. You got to start somewhere. So I, I promise that we're going to talk about advocacy over the next five years. So let's go into the future. Well, what's 2019 going to be like? Well, we, we might have driverless cars. And we, we might have Blade Runners. Yeah, that's in 2019. But I think, you know, if we stick to, you know, a very good if we basically are able to like create a policy and stick to it and leverage all the different marketing and you know, advocacy resources we have, you know, we could start trampling some hyenas who try, to, who try to threaten us and get on our turf. I mean, this is where, this is where we should be in five years. We're, we're, we're protecting the pack. We have a strong community, and we're just going to make it stronger. So with that, I would like to open up for questions. <laughs> that makes you buy him another private island. That, that's a huge, the fear of Larry Ellison and MySQL is a huge emotional and powerful piece um, that, that sort of wasn't on here. And, and Enterprise TV as like the, who do I sell? Because I'm obviously in the corporate world, but who do I, you know, I don't have a single point of contact? Heck yeah, you do. You can talk to them. Um, so it, it's, it's another market, but fear of Larry Ellison is a <coughs> Mm -hmm. So we could add that to our list of threats. <laughs> but I, yeah, and I think, you know, but this is, yeah, and you're right, I should have touched upon this more, but a lot of what's helped grow Postgres popularity in the past five years was that acquisition back in 2009. And, you know, and, a lot, and I think 
and there's also two different sides of it too. So I play more in the startup world. I mean, it's primarily the world I've been in. And for us, we're always, you know, we, we, we can't afford Oracle licenses. We can't afford SQL Server licenses. So we're always looking, you know, what's the best cheap slash free technology out there. And, you know, a lot of people in the startup world don't, they, they may not even know that MySQL is owned by Oracle. But maybe we make them aware of that and say, you know, basically by using MySQL, you're putting yourself up to, you know, paying for software license fees down the road. And, you know, because you're going to have built up some of your, your technology on it, it might be very hard for you to move away from it, unless you hire one of our consultants. <laughs> All right. Yes. That, that, uh, and people usually think of that in terms of finding your five closest pizza places, but it is amazing for name searches. Uh, fairly short strings like that, where you want the best matches to a partial uh, string. Yeah, and I've actually done both. I've actually used it for both, and I, I completely agree. You know, it works very well. And of course, like the key is, you know, highlighting on that point. If you're doing for something, you know, text-based, you really want it to be short. Because when I tried to do anything longer, I, I was getting very weird results. And then, of course, at that point, you should be using full text search. Which, by the way, Postgres is a relational database with built-in full text search. Boom. That, that, that is another good buzz point. But I, I really think the strongest buzz point candidate is, is KNN. That's, that's, a that, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a very good point. Yeah, and the good thing is over the past few years, the community has focused a lot on the ease of use, just you know, on the software side as well. But, and, and actually, I did have a slide on this. I, I think I took it out because I was worried about time. I think you know, one, one thing that, you know, I, you know, where we can look to improve, so for instance, look MongoDB. It's very easy to create a replica right then and there. With Postgres, it takes a little bit more work. And of course, like our replication system is you know, much more complex. And there's tools out there to manage it, but Again, ease of use. How do we promote the tools that make it easy? How do, are there things that we can do you know, within core Postgres to make it easy? Fair. Um, I think one of the problems that we have is that as a community, we're afraid of, this is going to sound weird, we're afraid of raising money. We're, we're confused between free and open source. And as an example, I started the last year this kind of software issue where there was nothing there. As of today, it's become the fourth largest user group of Postgres in the GitHub platform. And uh, we just created the association to be able to, to raise the Postgres. We are now probably going to be raising more money than we're going to be spending next year. So we're going to use that profit to the amount of extra yeah. things like tutorials or in, uh, information in Spanish, several other things. I think this is the way to go because most of the things that you mentioned today, they need money. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's very difficult to find enough volunteers for doing this this time. So we have to somehow be aware that if we are able to raise this money, it's not bad as a community. And we can use it to leverage all the things that we need to, to do, even to, to pay for some developers, too. I mean, it's not bad to do that. I, mean, I think that sometimes we are afraid. Not the companies who are supporting Postgres, but the community is. Mm -hmm. And I think that also that gets into, like, a, a grander issue as well, but that's why we have you know the the doubleter and the Royal Oak to you know hammer out some some strategies around this, yeah. as well. Yeah, I think a lot of the web hosting companies are scared of it because of the installation issues, which now I guess are a lot easier. Before mm -hmm. it was hard to tune the database and get what you wanted. And I know, for instance, the web server I go with, the, the uh, Black Sun, mm -hmm. they have the honest server where they still have Postgres, but they're not supporting it. They won't upgrade it and so on. 
So I think a lot of the problem is uh, get web hosting companies to realize, hey, this is easy now. Mm -hmm. And it can be installed without yeah. having to tune so heavily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, if you go, if you go to the website, you, for instance, like if you're running on Ubuntu, you know, app, app get PostgreSQL. I mean, it really, it really doesn't get much easier than that. But yeah, I mean, and there's, there's also there's good guides on the tuning, too. I mean, I think there's still a little bit of a, a dark art to some of the tuning. But you know, there are a lot of resources out there to do it. Um, it's actually it's interesting that you mentioned the web hosting companies. Uh, while we were doing the review of the professional services, we actually we divide them into two groups. We have uh, one called uh, support, which you know, we try to gear to more towards consulting, and one for hosting. And it was actually amazing going through the, the hosting companies that will still exist in the directory, how many of them are running versions of Postgres like before version 9. I mean, I think I saw some like all the way back to like 8.0, 8.1. So they're so, Yeah, yeah. They want MySQL is what they really support, and mm -hmm. Postgres, they have this old version on that they're not updating. Mm -hmm. So yeah. something to be done in that regard would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. But do, do we do we have anyone at Red Hat still to help with that or? Yeah, we can't. I mean, they have their policy, and I would actually, I would actually dispute your assertion that the MySQL in there is fairly new. It's not. It's newer. It's not <coughs> fairly new. But but I mean, basically, for the Red Hat enterprise releases, they have whatever it was that they chose in that particular version to start, which tends to be, you know, if if you know, any post version. One or two questions, sorry. One or two questions. Uh, but then they okay. stick with that one forever. Uh, it's going to be interesting if we expire it before next month. All right, so, so time for one more question. That's a very good point. And actually, one thing we did at, you know, in New York City is that you know, we've been trying to engage the, you know, let's call it the community's enterprise level customers and trying to figure out exactly what they need. Um, and you know, we're, we're actually trying to plan to put together, you know, it's still in the early stages, but you know, we're trying to figure out the appropriate form in which to basically get those exact answers and just do, let's call them community customer interviews and figure out what, what exactly were you lacking at this point. Or, do we have everything, and we just do, we just need to push in the right way? So, um, all right, I'm I'm getting uh, the signal to wrap it up. So, uh, I'll be around for the next couple of days. If you have any questions, more than happy to answer them. Thank you.